So hello, welcome back to Being Black with Camille Smith. Today we are welcoming Danielle Burns. She actually graduated with me in May of 2020. She got her degree in Bachelor of Arts of Political Science with a concentration in intersectionality. She actually continued her education and she's now pursuing her master's in political science, focusing on international relations. And after she gets that degree, she hopes to go to law school and eventually practice civil rights law. So if you don't know who she is, get right. Um, <laughs> Danny and I actually had a very interesting relationship because I feel like during undergrad, we didn't know each other as much. I always knew Danny B because it's so catchy, but I think we actually grew to know one another after we graduated because both of us tried to um, start kind of going into new endeavors. So I started my YouTube channel. I kind of tried to rebrand myself after college and she was super supportive. And she actually started a new brand in business, which hopefully she'll be able to talk about a little bit after. Um, and I was super supportive. And if you don't know what it is, she's going to talk about it a little bit, you know, a little bit later. Um, but again, super excited to have Danny on. And without further ado, Danny, what does being Black mean to you? Well, first of all, thank you, Camille, for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I love everything that you're doing. So just being here is honestly an honor. Um, but yeah, so for me, being Black means a lot of things. It's definitely a multifaceted question, but I think the main thing that I can think of is having to be very self-aware. Um, and I think, you know, it really is different for everybody, but in terms of my experiences and who I've become, my Blackness has always, you know, really led the way in the endeavors that I participate in. Um, and I feel like that's how I got really interested in intersectionality because Intersectionality is really just being aware of your different identities and how they affect your realities. And when I think of Blackness today, I think of intersectionality. I think of what does being Black mean in every single space, in every single situation that I'm in, whether it's being a woman, um, my sexuality, relationships, all of that. I just am constantly thinking about my Blackness. So it, it's just something that's always on my mind for sure. And then do you have an actual concrete, you know, memory of when you first found out that you were Black? Um, so I think I, I think I always knew I was Black. So I grew up in Vallejo, California, in the Bay Area. Everyone's Black. And, you know, Blackness is really celebrated when you're around all Black people. Um, but I think the first time I got an idea of race and it being problematic was when I moved to Arizona to a predominantly white school and everyone was just so not fascinated. The, the negative word for fascinated is how they felt about my race. And it was constantly coming up, even first grade, second grade, you know, that there's a black girl in class or like, why is your hair like that? Why are you so dark? Like, what's wrong with you? All those things. And that was really my introduction into blackness as a negative. So talk a little bit about how was it growing up in your area? So you had two places to actually kind of grow up in. Talk a little bit about it. Yeah. So in California, like I said, I'm from the Bay Area, home of the Black Panthers. Um, and my father grew up in Oakland. So I was introduced into Blackness and the culture and the movements at a very young age. So I was like really nerdy as a kid and I was like obsessed with like civil rights activists. Like that's who I had posters of. Like that's, that was me. Like if you, I could tell you anything about Martin Luther King Jr. I really could. And so that was my California experience. I was like, wow, like I, I thought from a very young age, like you're going to be great. Like blackness is synonymous to greatness. And it wasn't until I moved where I was like, okay, where I started kind of feeling like insecure with my own skin color. Um, and I think that that's when it became very difficult for me. And I think I really struggled with my blackness um, really up until I went to college. And then I feel like that's when I kind of entered this new phase in my life. So in college, how did you feel your relationship with your blackness or race in general kind of changed? Um, so when, so when I decided to go to Villanova, I was like, okay, I need to do some type of research on the demographics. And I saw that there was not a lot of black people. And I knew I did not want to have the same 
experience that I had in high school. So there was gonna have to be some type of soul searching and reflecting so that when I enter this space and I may be the only one that looks like me in a lot of spaces at this new place, I wanna feel secure in myself. So it was a really hard like self-love summer going into college. And then by the time I got there, I was very secure in my blackness. I was like, you know what? I'm beautiful, I'm unique, you know, you're lucky to have me. It's like the real way that I went in going to a university like Villanova. And then to pivot a little bit, do you have any advice for your younger self? Um, I definitely do, I definitely do. And I can think of like two quick things. So the first thing would be to just live in the moment. Like I was someone that planned their life out like 30 years ahead. Um, like when I was in high school, I had my life planned out to like 40, like I really did written out, and, written out and everything. And I remember one of my teachers saying like, you know, that's not going to happen. Like, can you be flexible? And I'm like, yes, says you. Okay. Um, so I would just tell my younger self, just live in the moment. And then also just like show a little bit more compassion to my parents and hug my mom a little tighter would probably be, um, the best advice that I would give. So thank you so much. Um, I think this conversation today is going to be really awesome. Um, we actually had another topic and Danny reached out to me and was like, hey, a lot of stuff is happening in the States. I think we should talk about it. And um, that's why our topic today is going to be being Black right now. And I'm, again, really excited to talk to Danny about it because she studies things like this. Um, so Danny, do you want to kind of give a summary of what happened in Washington, D.C. on January 6th. Sure. So in January 6th, we saw insurgents basically occupy the federal Capitol building. And there's been a lot of speculation on whether these events were spontaneous or whether they were planned. These events were actually planned. Um, there was a lot of talk about it in the previous weeks about what was actually going to happen. But this was a planned event. It really wasn't a random event that, you know, Trump supporters kind of just put together on a whim. These are people from all across the country that decided to come down to DC and protest the official counting of the votes. Uh, it, it's something that happens every year, but this year it was January 6th and all of the delegates confirmed that, you know, Joe Biden was going to be set to be the president elect. And basically we had a lot of people that were not happy about that. Uh, and so they decided to occupy the Capitol. And I think it's really interesting because for those that actually follow me on Instagram, I have like a self-care Wednesday thing. So on self-care Wednesday, I actively try not to look at the news. Um, and that's just something for me personally, because I know that a lot of a lot of news as of late can be very triggering to me. So I actively try and take Wednesdays just to kind of unplug. Um, so I actually didn't know what was happening until one of my friends actually called me and was like, yo, are you watching what's going on? And I'm like, what do you mean what's going on? Um, and I'm not really a news watcher either. So I turned on the news. I don't know what station it was, but I turned on the news and I just saw people like hitting police officers. And I'm like, pause. Right. What, <laughs> what's right. happening? I think one of the main things that I don't want to say made me laugh, but kind of made me laugh was one of the anchors was talking about this picture of a protester holding a Blue Lives Matter flag and was actively trying to hit a police officer. And I was like, yes, right. The right. cognitive dissonance, like, does anyone else not see what's going on? Um, right. Of course, like I went to Twitter and like Twitter was, you know, making all the jokes. And for me, like it did make me feel a little bit better. Mm -hmm. but watching it was I wasn't surprised right like, you feel surprised by it and I think the nature of what was happening I I should have but nothing about the anger and the lack of response of the police was surprising to me um mm -hmm. if you felt the same way looking at it yeah I mean I honestly had an identical response I was pretty busy most of yesterday and I think someone texted me, one of my friends that doesn't live in the United States texted me, was like, what's going on in your country? And you never know in America, it could be anything. So I kind of just thought it was a joke. And I go outside, or not outside, I go into my living room and I turn on CNN. And by that time, they had fully occupied the building. 
so I wasn't really sure what was going on. And then after going through Twitter, I kind of saw the same things. I saw, I think the same video that you're talking about. Uh, it, it truly was no surprise to me, especially studying this. This is something that we talked about a lot within my courses and something I'm currently researching right now is was responses to the uh, previous election. I think it was less of surprise and more of more of a shock by the responses that you know the rest of the population was giving. So like I was surprised by them being surprised. Um, so I think that was kind of my main response to it. It definitely was disheartening to see. Don't get me wrong. It definitely was disheartening to see, but maybe not the same reasons as the rest of the population. And I think too, like, I, I feel the same way. And I think over the past, really all of 2020, um, it's been like this weird balance between, yes, like I recognize like some people won't understand the implications or the endeavors or obstacles that a lot of black people have to face. And it might be easier for black people to understand certain things because we have to actually deal with them on a regular basis. Mm. But to see the blatant double standard and to still see people like, oh, well, like we're just protesting like what we feel is right. I think right. that's the part that was the most disheartening because that kind of showed me that regardless, it, it's not a matter of people not understanding. I genuinely be believe that people don't want to understand. Like they get it, right. they acknowledge it. They're right. just like, oh, well, this is just how it's gonna be. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I remember seeing a lot of, again, tweets and posts about, um, oh, like what if it was all black people? Like it, I genuinely believe it would have been very much a bloodbath and, I, and th that's, a, that's a fact. And I don't think people were trying to bring it up or even me talking to like my family about it. I didn't bring it up to be like, yeah, like all of them should have been shot. Like, yeah, like mm -hmm. than anyone dying type thing. But it was just like, why is this double standard here? And there's still people that aren't acknowledging it. Right. And like, I think for me, it was just very saddening because again, I, I feel like there's like, um, I always struggle with not, feeling like seen in a lot of white mm -hmm. places and like I feel like that's kind of like the peak like it's very blatant like you can't miss it in my eyes you were literally looking at the same thing and mm -hmm. they're still actively trying not to see something that very much affects me my family my peers on a regular basis and affects them quite frankly because the world right. looking at us and, and they're laughing as they should be um so like, as like your inter international relations aspect of it, like globally, what do you think like other people are looking at us as, if that makes sense? Right, so that's a very interesting question. Um, I think that people our age around the globe are looking at it and like you said, pretty much laughing, but I think it's also, we are entering a new phase of global politics, a new phase of international relations where America can no longer serve as that symbol. So we've known for a long time as minorities, especially as black women, that you know our foundation did not represent the way that we were treated. So we're known globally, you have these world, these world leaders coming out saying, you know, America is supposed to be the symbol of democracy and freedom, even though we know that that was not the case for us, but it's now being shown on television to the rest of the world and the rest of the world is going to have to reckon with this. So this isn't only a matter of American politics and only a matter of you know, a, th a threat towards American democracy, it's really attacking the foundation of global politics. When you have an, a, a United States that is one of the greatest powers in the world and you know, if you don't have the beacon of freedom and democracy functioning the way that we need it to function to justify our actions on the global stage. So what can you say when you have a United States that invades a country or a United States that works with the United Nations to work on democratizing you know, states in the Middle East? What can you say when we don't have that down packed at home? So I think that we, you know, as Americans, we have the luxury of focusing solely on domestic politics, whereas in other countries, they don't have that luxury. And they're constantly 
constantly looking at American politics. I heard a really interesting quote from a seminar I went over, I looked at over the summer and she said, you know, for Americans, we don't realize that an American election affects millions of people that don't live in America. So people's lives are affected by American elections, even though they cannot vote in them. And that's something that is very hard for people to realize when we're watching these things. So it really transcends our day to day. This is something that, you know, holds weight across the oceans, you know? Yeah, I think it's actually really important that you mention that because I realized throughout my four years, I had just, a, I was ignorant to how the U.S. affected everyone else. Now, granted, like I took the history classes and, um, you know, world history and things like that. Like I took those classes and like, I, I do think I have a relatively good understanding of just like the facts that were taught to me, but it was really, I always shout her out in basically every episode, but it was really my best friend, Maciel, that like opened up my eyes to the U.S. basically terrorizing other co countries. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's what it is. Um, and it was actually her blog or her Instagram. Well, she has a blog and it's her Instagram, but um, Beyond the Bubble that actually recommended this podcast that I listened to earlier today. And it was something that I noticed when I was watching the news reports on it. And everyone was talking about like, oh, like we're not a third world country. Like we're not the banana Republic, like all these things. And like, I, it was so consistent across so many different news channels that I was like banana Republic. And I was like, what like for me what does that even mean because I don't necessarily you know study these things and as I was listening to this podcast it was very much making the point that the United States cannot take responsibility for its own actions it will literally not acknowledge the turmoil and just the destruction that it's caused on so many of its own citizens and the world that when something like this happens even though for both of us and for a lot of other people within the black community, it was not surprising that it was going to happen. Honestly, I thought it was going to happen a little bit earlier, um, mm -hmm. but nonetheless, it happened. And still politicians and people on news channels were like, oh, like, this isn't who we are. Even uh, the president elect Joe Biden literally tweeted like, this isn't who we are. Like we're better than this. And I'm like, right. are we like our right. elective? Are we? I don't personally, I don't really think that we are. And I'm wondering, do you think, why do you think that as a nation, like we can't take responsibility for things? Uh, that is a heavy, heavy question. But I think that um, if we were to take responsibility for one, we would have to take responsibility for all. So a lot of people question, you know, why, you know, when we're thinking of police brutality over the past summer, you know, why can't we address systemic racism? Why can't we address white privilege? Why can't we address, you know, all the atrocities they have called, pe they have caused people of color in this country? You know, if we address that, our foundation as America, as Americans is taken away from us. And when I say us, I don't really mean you and I, I really don't. I really mean, you know, white Americans they would have to reckon with the fact that who they are, what they are and what they have is a product of the oppression and destruction of you know, millions of people, you know, multiple generations. America as a whole is a product of you know, oppression. And I think that it's really hard for America to be accountable. You know, the international community also doesn't require America to be accountable. And when I'm talking about the international community, talking about the other great powers, you know, so, you know, the smaller countries that are being devastated by this, they are asking for it. But when you have a country so powerful, you know, when we think of the powerful people within our, within our country, they're not required to be accountable. As much as we scream at them and we tweet and we post and we, we protest, they still weren't required to be accountable. So when you have people saying, you know, yesterday, this is not who America is, it absolves them of any responsibility. Because if a white American or a politician says, this is who America is, they also have to take accountability for why they haven't done anything to change it. So you really have, I, I think when I, before I thought that people didn't know, 
But I really believe that 99% of Americans are more than aware of the atrocities happening domestically. They're more than aware that injustice and oppression is happening on the day to day. But for some reason, it is almost, it's just so hard to them to reckon for that. You know, James Baldwin talks about the moral monsters and that white people in America had to convince themselves that what was happening was moral because they couldn't conceptualize all of the atrocities that their ancestors had done that they are now benefiting from. So when you have generation after generation that has convinced itself that it is not responsible for its actions, that's how you get to yesterday. And then you think, you know, as a society, we say, you know, we did this and we're talking about 1776. We talk about, you know, the founding fathers, we accomplished this, this is what we stand for. But when we think of the negatives that have happened in America, we don't say we, we say that was then, we're here now. But when we're talking about the positives, we're taking all that in, we're responsible for all of that. But it allows America to be this great power without reckoning, you know, with the damage and the hurt that it's caused. I definitely think that the rhetoric, I mean, the rhetoric that has been used over the past four years has been so incredibly interesting um, to the point that, I mean, like I majored in engineering, but like um, in a dream world, like I wish that I kind of did communications like concentrating on rhetoric because I think that our words are so incredibly important and how you said it was beautiful. Um, I very much noticed in just talking to other people specifically white people when we when I'm you know being confrontational about like hey like do you understand the white privilege that's literally on display like do you see it and like oh well like it's them it's not us like it's not it's 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 almost like an othering like you're they're actively trying to other themselves from their ancestors as you said but they're still very much benefiting from it so it, it again for me I think it's just genuinely the largest example of cognitive dissonance that you can acknowledge your history, but only look at the positives of it. So all of the negatives are actively affecting everybody else for generations. Um, for, it's, it's, it's mind boggling to me because I feel like I just continue to have the same conversations over and over and over and over again. And it's like, what, now I'm, I'm in a place and it's like, okay, this happened, you know, January 6th, it happened. They, uh, again, saw a tweet and they were like chilling in a, in a hotel lobby. Um, that was a funny tweet and it made me laugh too, but um, we're, it's done. So kind of where do we go from here? Um, and I saw a lot of people talking about like, oh, like we need to push the 25th amendment. Um, and personally, I don't think exactly, I'm like, I, like, I don't think, I wouldn't hold my breath. Where do you think we go from here? As the Black community and as a country, where do we go? Right. So to me, this is a really isolated event. And I, I don't know who will agree with me, but I think this is very separate from the Black community. I think it is an act of hypocrisy. And I think one of the reasons why yesterday was hurtful because it was a slap in the face. It was very clear the way that Black people were valued in this country versus white people. It was on display like never before. I think this was, you know, one of the biggest representations for people our age. You know, we see police brutality, we see that, and we see these reasonings, how they try and justify it. But that was a moment in time where you, you know, you even had Republicans saying it. And I don't, I don't really value what they have to say, but you even had these people that were coming out like, wow, we're going to have to reckon with this because you can't justify it. However, I will say that, you know, what people do need to think about, is this the end of something or is this the beginning of something? You know, the country really opened a new chapter with letting Donald Trump become the president of the United States. And we are going to have to reckon with those actions. To me, this was a product of, you know, a lot of different events. And I don't think that this is the end of that. I don't think it's, I think it's similar to the pandemic. You have a lot of people asking, when are we gonna be able to go back to normal? When are we gonna be able to enter a life without masks and without social distancing? We are never getting back to 
pre-March 20, uh, 2020. We are in a post-pandemic world. Similar to Trump, we are in a post-Trump era. That is what we will enter into. It will not be normal. It will not be with the Barack Obama and the George Bushes. We are in a new era. And I think that, you know, moving forward as individuals and as Americans, or if you don't consider yourself that as someone that lives currently in America, we are going to have to decide how much we're willing to take. And I think it really starts with white people. And we saw white people have more power than they think yesterday. So when you're talking and you're thinking of your white friends, your white colleagues, your white allies, they have the power to demand more. So when you had white people over the summer saying they didn't know what to do, we can't go march up those steps without being violently taken down. And I'm, there's black people that are willing to risk their lives for that. But what we saw is that white people are able when, want, when they want to, to demand more. They are able to cause disruptions in a system that they believe to be oppressive. So I think it really is on the hands of these white moderates, which, you know, Martin Luther King so eloquently said, the biggest stumbling block, the biggest barrier. And, you know, it, it also goes to show that people didn't listen to black people over the summer. You had a lot of white people saying we're listening and we're learning and they didn't listen not one bit at all. So unless white people decide that they're going to listen to the minorities in this country, that they are going to, you know, pay attention to what's going on outside of their whiteness, I really think we're going to see the destruction of the United States or the United States as we know it. Um, and it's, it sounds, it may sound crazy, but studying this, you know, we have this idea of American exceptionalism. And that's kind of what we talk about. We've only had one constitution. Uh, we've been pretty successful since our inception. I don't think we're gonna be able to withstand that if we don't put an end to the oppression of these groups. And if we don't put an end to white privilege, white power and white entitlement, because that what was on that is what was on display yesterday. Um, so I think moving forward, and I'll wrap it up. I think moving forward, it is really a matter of self-reflection and reckoning with Americans and what we want our society to be a year from now, five years from now. Um, especially when you're thinking we just passed the deadliest day of the pandemic. And that wasn't even highlighted because you had uh, this atrocity in DC. So we're really going to have to do some self-reflection or society as we know it is really going to take a turn for the worse. Yeah, I, that wasn't something else that I talked with my dad about the other day. Like, I feel like in the past few months, and again, all of 2020, but the past few months specifically, like politicians, specifically Donald Trump, have been doing so many things that even I, like, I actively try to, like, even though I'm working, like, it's still very much wear a mask at work, social distance, um, like, I'm a scientist, like, I have to be six feet apart from other scientists in the lab, things like that, and, like, in my day-to-day, -day, like, there very much is a pandemic, and, like, people need to make sure that they're wearing their mask, etc., but, like, if you're tuned in all the time to the news, like, you can genuinely forget that, and the fact that my dad was, like, yeah, like, we literally had the most deaths from the pandemic the other day. And I wouldn't have known that had he not told me because of everything that's been happening recently. I think it's so it's so overwhelming. And I want like I want to try and end the video by giving our viewers, but black people, like what advice do you have to kind of try and protect not necessarily just ourselves, but like our mental through what's happening now and kind of moving forward. Um, to have hope, but to continue to be realist. Mm -hmm. So we started yesterday with tremendous wins in Georgia and people saw that as a sign of progress. And then you saw what happened in DC right after. And it's really easy to get caught up with descriptive wins. And what I mean by that is like on the surface, when we're looking at it, it seems like a win. And then we're so discouraged when you have a George Floyd, when you have, you know, these hate groups occupying the Capitol building. 
you know, it's important to have hope and to truly believe that we can make progress and that we can move forward and that we can create a more just society, but to continue to be realist and pay attention to what is actually happening and to really start studying uh, what it is we need to do to make a more legitimate push towards uh, justice and equity. And just like for me personally, I do genuinely feel that we will make progress. And that, that's something that I personally hold on to. Um, everyone has their own role within what that progress will look like. Um, social media has been like a very, very large thing. Um, I like to think that even these videos, being able to expose people to conversations like this, um, even though it might not have a concrete impact, it might you know change someone's opinion or at least make them think about what their opinion was. But also it's okay to have self-care days sometimes um, mm -hmm. because when, when people burn out, like I think, I think genuinely burnout within the black community is gonna be one of the hardest things to get over because you have, I have so many people, you included that like really learn about these things and have concrete ideas on how we're gonna move forward. But you don't want those people to be burnt out because they're going to be our next leaders. So mm -hmm. trying to figure out how you can take care of yourself, take care of your mental. If that is unplugging for 30 minutes, then do that because in the long haul, we need people like you um, and a lot of my other friends to be able to persevere for the long haul because uh, it's gonna be a long time to uh, get that progress that we hope for. So thank you. Do you have anything else that you want your viewers to know? Um, just one little piece, one more piece of advice. Just make sure you're putting your energy in the right places because I think that's where burnout is more likely is if you're putting your energy in the wrong places. So like you said, you know, give some energy to self-care and give some energy to learning more about what we can do to create a better society. And I think it'll prevent that fatigue that, you know, I would say we're all feeling. So that'd be my little Danny B with the T advice. Danny B with the T. That's another thing. I'm gonna plug her anyway. Please follow the, her on Instagram. I'm gonna put all of her socials and business and everything that is her in the description box. Um, because like you really need to know who she is. Like you need to. If you don't, I'm putting you on because. I think like I've just always admired you as a person because you were just so authentic and comfortable with confrontation. And I, I'm a very confrontational person. I feel very comfortable talking when I think that something's wrong and to see someone else that looks like me be able to do that is just like, cool. I love like, that. I love that. Yeah. Um, thank you guys for tuning in. I really hope that you enjoyed and be back next week for another video. Bye.